What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. We have a very exciting uh, stream for everyone today. Uh, we are being joined again by Carissa Dorson, uh, who just finished up shooting one of the uh, launch videos uh, for the brand new BS1H box camera. So as you've probably noticed, this is a month worth of BS1H box camera coverage. Um, these, uh, let's get some kind of core stuff out of the way here. If you are new to these broadcasts, these are our weekly live streams that we do on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, where we talk about technology, cameras, uh, techniques, tips and tricks, all kinds of things that you can think of when it comes to photo and video oriented uh, content. Uh, and for the rest of this month, we're going to be talking probably a little bit more on the technical side uh, with just seeing what the brand new camera, the BS1H, was capable of doing in the hands of incredibly talented filmmakers. Uh, so outside of these kinds of streams, we also do interviews with other types of content creators. So photographers, which we haven't really done many photography uh, streams uh, over the last uh, couple of months at least. Uh, so we'll probably get back to doing some of those. Uh, but we also have from time to time Matt Frazier join us like we did last week to give you guys an opportunity to reach out to us and actually communicate your questions and uh, technical troubleshooting with people directly from Panasonic Lumix. So these platforms are totally 100% driven by the community uh, with the topics that we discuss, with the questions that everyone asks and we answer as, uh, as much as we can live on the stream. So if you have a question for either myself or Carissa on the stream, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before the question so I can see it on my end. It pops up in yellow. Uh, we've been doing this for a little over, almost two years at this point. Well, eh, it's closer to like a year and three quarters, but we've been doing this for a while. So if you've joined us, you know the, the, the process with it. If you haven't already, uh, make sure to give us a, a subscribe and a like on these videos because it helps us tremendously in growing this platform. Uh, and if you if you don't already, go take a look at the Lumix USA Instagram account, uh, well, over on Instagram, where we also share a lot of this information and can continue these conversations outside of the Lumix Live platform. I try to interact as much as I can on that platform throughout the week between these live streams. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the Lumix Pro service. We have the red tier and the platinum tier here in the United States. Uh, if you are someone who wants to make sure you get the most out of your equipment, make sure to take a look at one of these two options. The red tier is our free membership that gets you your three year extended warranty, online service repair uh, support, uh, and just kind of all the basic uh, process that you would need if you ever happen to need your, to send your camera in for service. Then we have the Platinum tier, which is our paid level service. This gets you that three-year manufacturer warranty, so you get that uh, you know, kind of peace of mind from manufacturer defects. But on top of it, you get two-day repairs with free next-day shipping both ways, 20% off out of warranty repairs if you happen to drop or break something. You also get a welcome kit, which includes a Peak Design strap, so it's a really nice strap to uh, uh, really get a, a, a better one than what you normally get in the box. You also get annual sensor cleanings and EVF cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates, and probably the coolest part about it is that you get an exclusive hotline where you can call into our service team uh, to get support on issues that you may be having. So, outside of that, as we said, we're going to be talking about the BS1H today and its use uh, in the hands of a, an incredibly accomplished filmmaker. So, we're going to, before I bring Chris in, we're going to show the piece uh, that was shot. Um, now, we're also going to be linking in the description and in the cards on the playback of this, uh, both the standard dynamic range as well as a high dynamic range version if you happen to have an HDR uh, compatible viewing device. So you'll be able to kind of see what it is we're going to talk about and come up with some questions that you may have for this stream. So let's uh, take a look at the video now. Thank you. 
All right, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so that is it. It was one of the coolest pieces I think we've shot. So uh, without further ado, I want to bring Carissa in on this conversation so we can uh, get into all the nitty gritty about this project. So hi, Carissa. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. How are you? Yeah. I'm doing great. I'm doing great today. Uh, thanks for coming back uh, for the stream. Um, these are these are always so much fun. Like I, I I love talking with filmmakers and 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 just seeing, you know, all the cool stuff that that's been produced over the years, and then being able to you know have the ability to see it before everyone else does, and then now watch everyone else's response to it. Um, so for for those that are joining us new that haven't uh, joined before when you've been on, um, could you give us a little bit of a bio, who you are, what you do? Sure. Um, I'm a cinematographer. I started out shooting a lot of comedy, um, but I do every genre, uh, lots of narrative pieces, um, a couple features, but I also do commercials, music videos. Um, my most recent credit um, on TV, at least, was A Little Late with Lily Singh. Um, so I am a union DP and I'm still kind of breaking into that, that union television world. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, obviously not the first time that, that we've worked with you, um, on, on some projects, um, you know, being an ambassador and all of that fun stuff that we've got here. Um, so what, when, when it came time for, for this project, you know, shooting with the box camera, like what, what were your, you know, kind of first impressions? Like when, when I think it was Matt that shipped you the camera, like how, how did that go when you first got the camera? Oh, when I first got it, I, um, I took it out of the box and it was so small. Like I took a bunch of pictures of myself just holding it. It was like this little <laughs> cute camera. Um, so I was super excited. I, I had already done the, the video for the S1H um, and this camera I couldn't believe was even smaller and more modular and obviously really up my alley because I like being able to build up cinema cameras um, and put whatever I want, whatever monitor I want. And um, yeah, so it was, it was tiny and I was able to work with it and build it into the camera that I needed. <laughs> And, you know, with, with the, the equipment that you use, like what, what kind of cameras do you normally, you know, like kind of shoot with? Cause I know that you, you, from our previous conversations, you've got a pretty wide selection of what cameras you've used for production. Yeah. Um, it, it's a big range. Um, I, I also own a couple Panasonic Evo ones. So I've shot with those a lot from like personal projects to commercials and, um, I'll typically shoot on an Alexa mini for projects. Um, producers love that camera. It's a beautiful camera. <laughs> um, yeah, I've worked with everything from Sony to Canon to Alexa and obviously lots of huge fan of Panasonic and Lumix. Yeah. yeah. So with, when, when working with something like this, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by seeing how someone at your level, you know, kind of rigs equipment up. You know, there there are so many so many different ways that people are are so accustomed to working with, whether it's a mirrorless camera or cinema camera or you know those kind of like hybrid in between cameras that are all starting to come out. And I I, I would I would venture to guess that the box camera, um, whether it be the the BS1H or a BGH1 for those that are using the Micro Four Thirds variant of it, um, I would imagine that you probably treat it more like a a f bigger cinema camera, right? Yeah, or definitely. And I mean, I expected it to be heavy when I built it out a little bit more. I mean, not heavy, but um, <laughs> that's kind of what happened when I did, when I um, built out the S1H because it's, um, I have pods and uh, V-mount battery and a small HD monitor and Atlas anamorphic lenses. And, and then all, all of a sudden it was heavy. Um, <laughs> but with the BS1H, um, wooden camera sent me a great cage for it and with a mini basically a baby v-mount plate 
um, and a port, I got a port keys monitor from you. Um, and it was still very small. Um, and yeah, I would definitely, this is more for a cinema shoot, I would say, than the S1H because it has the SDI ports, um, which is huge for me, um, rather than being forced to use HDMI. Um, and I, I also had a Teradek wireless uh, transmitter on the camera. So I definitely built it into a cinema camera for sure. Nice. Well, we, we have uh, one of our first questions in here from, um, from JD3. It um, says, great job on the video. Uh, being a smaller and lighter in weight than the S1H, how was balancing the new body with the glass that you use? And also, what, what glass did you use on the project? So for this one, rather than, rather than renting other primes, I just went with the native um, S-series Lumix lenses. Um, so I had a 24, 30, a 24, 35, 50, and 85. No, not the 35, but the other ones. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. 24, 50, 85, and then a 24 to 70 zoom. Um, and I assume the balancing question was about the using a Ronin or? Yeah, yeah, because I, I, in the, um, in the setup, I guess, I mean, like, you know, when, when you're working with a camera like this to kind of expand on JD's question, like, how, how did you have the camera rigged up? Because I know there's the BTS video that we have that's published that we'll, we'll put a link to, um, in the chat for this later. Um, there were a couple ways that you had the camera rigged up. Um, for the balance side of this, could you kind of walk through a couple of the different setups that you used for it? Sure. Um, and I was lucky for this one that I got a second one straight from Japan. So, um, <laughs> and that's the great thing about how small they are. I could just have a couple of them on set. Um, so one was sitting on the, the Ronin S2 gimbal. And then the other one I had in the wooden camera cage um, on a tripod basically. Um, and then with the gimbal, I used it handheld and also uh, rigged it from a menace arm looking straight down at the bed. And I was able to connect to the DJI app and do that cool remote head rotating shot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So actually with the Ronin was uh, JD's question. So like when, when you go to, to balance like the cameras on a Ronin, like how does that, you, you know, obviously for those that aren't used to working with gimbals, um, how does that limit some of the camera choices that you would go or, you know, the, the mobility side of it, you know, did the BS1H bring, you know, different abilities that you didn't necessarily have with even like say the S1H? I think so. Um, for this one, I was just personally operating the gimbal. Uh, and for the S1H video, I chose to bring on a Ronin um, two operators. So it was a, a much bigger rig. Um, and I don't specialize in that at all. Um, I've never gone above just the Ronin S size. So, um, and I've used it with, uh, the GH fives too. Um, and this is the best experience I've, I've had with the Ronin S two, because, um, with the box camera, I just felt so free and, it was the first time I, I used uh, the Raven Eye function too. So I was able to go into my, basically use the Raven Eye to wirelessly connect to my phone. And that was the monitoring solution that I used on the gimbal. And so it, it was the lightest uh, gimbal rig I've ever had. And I was really, <laughs> it felt good to use it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I know the, with, with the Ronins, I think, um, you know, the, the vast majority of people that would be, as I forgot to mute my Mac here, I would imagine that the, the vast majority of people that are going to be working with cameras of this size, you know, you're, you're looking at what kinds of, you know, gimbals would be appropriate for something like this. And, you know, obviously, I mean, I, I, I don't do much video production at all, but even I have, uh, an RSC two um, from DJI that I picked up that like, it's, it's amazing how simple it is and how much easier it is to balance a box instead of the S1, you know, so you're not having to worry about like how far over the side goes. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to see what, um, you know, kind of what, what other people's opinions are in the chat. You know, if, if you guys are using, you know, the different kind of stabilization gimbals, which ones are you using? Shout it out in the chat. Cause, um, I, it's just a cool thing to figure out. Um, we do have another question from FC here. It says, um, 
Is it possible to stack several BS1H, BS1Hs together? I.e. a BS1H with a 2450 and an 85, all three setups at once to get three focal lengths for the same shot? I'm not <laughs> sure I'm following your question, FC. Do you mean like having them like literally stacked together like in a cube and then when we have the 35, put the 35 there? Um, I mean, you could. Your angles are going to be different because you're offset by about the same distance as the human eye. So... It'd be a little different. Um, it wouldn't, I think, function the way you might want it to function, though. Um, and good luck trying to balance that, I think. Um, you'd probably have to pull out the much bigger Ronin uh, gimbals to balance all four of those cameras at once. Excuse me. I think it's more complicated than it's worth, but I'm, I'm sure you could do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like working with those old studio cameras that have the lenses that just rotate on the front and just trying to do it that way. Um, but yeah, so there, there were a couple cool things that, that, that you talked about with setting up the, um, you know, the, the Ronin and the, and the way you had the camera set up, you know, I, in the BTS, um, setup, you know, we saw how, you know, you were flying the camera on just the gimbal and you were using, you know, a kind of more self-contained kit, but when you had the camera mounted up, um, above the bed shooting down, I assume it was when you were shooting down, you had it mounted up there, right? Yeah. How, how did you go about monitoring and, and, you know, actually working with the camera when you had it set up like that? Was there any kind of like trick that you found that worked best for you with something like that? Um, for monitoring, we actually did have the, the Teradek transmitter, um, also rigged up there. I think it was just like, um, I just had some sort of baby pin adapter, um, in order to keep it close. I think it was rigged to the Ronin S and I went HDMI out for that. Um, and it worked, it worked pretty well. Um, I'm trying to remember anything else I had up there. I, I had to rig a battery, I think for, for the Teradek, um, specifically. So yeah, those are two extra things that I put up for the menace arm so we could view what was going on. But then on the gimbal, when I was just roaming around with it, I was I was only viewing on my phone. Um, with with something like the Teradek, I mean, so how how common is is that kind of setup for for I mean a, a production on this scale? I mean, I know for a lot of people, they've probably not ever thought about doing wireless, um, you know, image transfer for stuff like that. But I know someone like you who's, who's been doing this for a while. Um, I, I was curious if you could share some of the experiences, why something like that's so important. Um, and if there was anything on the BS1H that actually kind of aided in um, setting the whole thing up for that kind of uh, production. Um, yeah, I use wireless monitoring for almost every shoot. I do now, it just makes things a little that much easier because if you're going handheld, you don't, you're not tethered to a monitor and you don't need someone wrangling you. Um, and you can also get, I, I love getting the handheld um, small HD uh, 703 bolts because uh, those are compatible with Teradek. Um, so it, it, you can have a small handheld monitor um, and a Teradek transmitter on your camera and the director is able to, to look at it or whoever you, you need. Um, like it's great for ACs too. Um, so yeah, I think for handheld situations or, or situations where you need to be very mobile, it's really important. Um, there are a lot of different strengths of Teradex or any other kind of um, wireless. And I usually go as high as I can that the budget allows for. So I'll usually get a Teradek 3000 um, because you, there's always issues. Like if, if you have client in another room or something, you want the signal to be able to reach. Um, so yeah, that's, that's normally a setup that I have. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for those that, that aren't, um, necessarily fully up to speed on cameras like the box camera, you know, I, there's some cool, I think, uh, features that this camera has that, um, I think some people may be a little confused as to why we picked certain, uh, you know, outputs on this camera, like the SDI output. It's only a 3G SDI, even though the camera is capable of shooting up to 6K24. Um, 
how how often in your experience of shooting would you ever find the need to be able to have an HDMI out and an SDI out and internal recording? Is that something that actually provides benefit uh, in, in in your project workflow? Um, yeah, there have been times where, um, for example, with my EVA 1, I've wanted to go out of both HDMI and SDI um, when I was using a Shogun recorder, for example, um, I would use uh, SDI to go into that monitor. And that was just a clean image because I needed to record the image. Um, and then out of HDMI, I sent, uh, basically to Video Village, I sent um, an image that also had our settings on it. Um, so it's nice to be able to like send, yeah, a clean image to one monitor if you want it. And then maybe an image to another monitor that has like ISO and your resolution and all those, that information, recording information on it. So that's one, one example where it came in handy. Um, so with, with this project, um, Alan has a question here. Uh, it says, um, well, the, the basics of it, um, were you recording internally to the SD cards or did you re record externally, um, to, you know, some sort of external device? And if, if so, which codecs did you work with and, and, uh, frame rates did you work with? I recorded internally and I did the, the 422 10-bit all I, uh, codec, um, so yeah, it was still, I love that it's still 10 bit and I can just record to SD cards. Um, and I also wanted to mention that, um, with the output question earlier, I was going into, for the most part, I was going into a port keys monitor with the SDI and then out of the port keys monitor into the wireless transmitter. Okay. That I did not know. I learned something new every day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, you know, with with the the project, I think you know, I, I, as I mentioned at, at the beginning of this, we there's two color grades for this project that are posted online. There's the uh, standard dynamic range, so the one that we showed at the beginning of the the stream is the SDR variant, so most widely visible by you know pretty much everyone that's got a display on it. But there's also an HDR. Uh, version of this and I know you know we were joking about this a little bit yesterday the whole process of of producing and exporting HDR content especially for you know platforms now like YouTube and um, these different outlets where HDR content is becoming more and more commonplace um, knowing that we as as Panasonic wanted to shoot the project and deliver it or you wanted to have the project delivered in HDR how did that address? Or how did that um, impact your your shooting and like things like your lighting and stuff like that? Did that have any kind of change to your normal workflow? I personally was not thinking about that in yeah d during production. That's not something I really kept in mind. Um, but I am still learning a, a little more about HDR and that whole post process. And it's honestly very confusing, <laughs> but um, I think the, my biggest takeaway from it is any of the really specular highlights, like um, the last shot where you see the street lights all around. I think those really, you can see so much more detail in them in the HDR um, version where you're actually watching on an HDR monitor. And even um, I think some MacBook Retina Pros are com compatible with, um, HDR. So I was able to see it on my, my screen and I could definitely tell the difference between the two, the two versions. So, you know, with, with this kind of setup, I, I, I think it goes without saying, but you, you shot this in a log profile, I would assume, correct? <laughs> log. Yeah. So how, how has your experience been working with Vlog or Vlog L, um, you know, since that's what's on the GH5s? that series camera. Um, yeah. How, how is it working with, with the log file that comes from Panasonic? It's great. I'll, I'll usually just pre watch uh, rec 709 um, LUT on set, but um, I love that log is able to save so much more detail in the highlights and shadows, obviously. Um, and I, I'm always monitoring and making sure that I'm not clipping on the highlights in the, in the actual log. Um, and it just gives me so much more room to play with, um, especially 
with my colorist, they appreciate when they have that extra information. Um, I don't personally color myself. I, I don't trust, I don't trust myself to do it, but, um, I like to hire someone else and then sit next to them. <laughs> so yeah, it was a great experience this time. My colorist, Noel Mackinson, um, works on a lot of different TV shows. So it was great to have him on this and, and learn more. I think that both of us were learning about HDR specifically for this one. And, and it was satisfying <laughs> when we were able to deliver it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's definitely um, for anyone that has the ability to, um, and like I said, I'm going to drop the, a, a link in the chat uh, and, and we'll make sure that it's in the description of the video. Um, to both the SDR and the HDR version, because that that HDR version, I think it 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 does add so much for those that that want to view it on something that is capable of of showing HDR. Um, I, I I'm curious what uh, f for your opinion though on it. Um, and there is there's no right or wrong answer with this. This is not a this this is not a a, a trick question or anything. But like seeing both the SDR and the HDR version of the projects, which, which did you feel came closer to what you envisioned for the project or was it, or was there not really a, a, a feeling one way or another for something like that? I would say the HDR came closer. Um, and I mostly saw that in the very last shot for whatever reason, um, that exterior, I just like how the, the sky is a bit darker. Um, the street lights are just like there's more saturation and um yeah you get more texture in that um but i think for the most part we i tried to make sure that the sdr was you know it reflected my vision and we did some sort of conversion when we did the hdr first and then we converted down to sdr so it was more or less like the same look um and I believe we we had to make a LUT um, to go on <laughs> HDR for the YouTube version so that people without oh, yeah. HDR screens could see it um, in its intended way. But obviously very confusing stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't like, I almost don't like knowing what I know about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like it's information that can never be taken out of your head now and is permanently there. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, for, for everyone in the, in the chat, if you haven't done, um, HDR exporting and loading it for delivery on something like YouTube, there's a lot of things that, that come into play, um, when you're considering how many different outlets are going to be viewing your content. You know, there's with YouTube, you have to account for, you know, does the person have an HDR monitor? What kind of HDR monitor do they have since there's like... I don't know, probably like 50 different specs of what is classified as an HDR monitor these days. Um, and one of the cool things is that it allows you to upload a, a conversion LUT with it as well so that you can have it where YouTube's backend and their systems don't have to just kind of do a generic SDR conversion to it, which will shift colors and change the contrast and, and just a lot of times it can look okay, but it's not necessarily going to look to the way, you know, you wanted that piece of content to come out. So I think what's, what's amazing is how after every single time that we've ever done HDR projects uh, from the Panasonic side, you always end up, like you said, learning a little bit more. And then you start realizing, I wish I didn't have to learn all of this extra little piece of information. Cause it's, it's, I, I would imagine this type of color grading is probably not something that you end up having to run into all that often in your normal shooting, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with with the project itself, I I think one of the one of the biggest things that that, that we haven't even touched on yet is is the the lighting choices for this whole project. I mean, you have such dynamic you know, kind of, um, impactful lighting on this project that, um, I think if I remember right correctly in the BTS, like the lighting is almost a character in its own in this piece. Yeah. Um, could you give us some insight into like, you know, how, how that idea came up and, you know, kind of the, the workings behind of, you know, how you actually got to the end result that, that we see on screen? Yeah. Um, it was really exciting to be able to come up with my own concept again. Um, and this one came 
from, I think specifically nights during quarantine when I couldn't turn my brain off and I was just riddled with anxiety <laughs> at night and couldn't sleep. Um, and then you start to notice the things around you, especially when it's dark and your eyes are adjusted. And, and I could see um, lights hitting my wall that from all the way down the street, just um, traffic lights that are super far away, but I could still see them um, and later took some photos, uh, like long ex exposure photos of them. And I just wanted to replicate that beauty that I found when I was so anxious that um, kind of brought me back, uh, it grounded me and like made me thankful for just the simple things. So I wanted to convey that in this video basically and have this dancer be inspired by that. Um, and I think music is another really great element um, and so much fun to work with. So I, I made sure, I, so I found a song where um, I could kind of line up the lighting and it had the right tone that I wanted. And um, as far as how we did it, we had, um, we were using a combination of Source 4 Licos that were gelled and then also uh, DMG Lumiere mix lights. So those are LED lights. Um, and the mix lights can be controlled via Bluetooth. So my gaffer was actually switching between the colors um, just using his phone. And then um, we had another, um, another crew member switching the Licos uh, kind of manually, I think. And uh, we also had this awesome backdrop donated to us uh, by Roscoe. Uh, they lent it, lent it to me for the shoot. Um, I work with Roscoe and DMG Lumiere a lot, so I want to give them a shout out. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the final element was Fresnel lights that were actually on doorway dollies. And uh, my key grip, uh, Carl Stewart, came up with this great pulley system with ropes um, so that the so that we didn't need somebody physically pushing the dolly past the window. Um, so we had, I think they were 650s, just going back and forth pretty fast. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pull up the uh, the actual BTS video because I want to make sure that people can see some of this stuff because I think um, what's so cool is is when when we have the opportunity to you know get get a little bit of a, a, a peek behind the curtain for, for projects like this. Um, you know, most of the time, I think people, people look at a lot of this stuff and it, it, if you're not someone who works in this industry, whether on my side, you know, from the, the manufacturer side or from, you know, your side on the actual creative side, it it's, it's amazing how much work goes into getting, getting these shots that just look stunning when everything's finalized. And, and this, the, the lighting choice, seeing how much work your team put uh, into making sure that, you know, as those lights are whipping back and forth, like that's, that was just so cool to actually see that kind of stuff. And then um, did I see it right that there was also a little bit of like some fog thrown in there too, to get some of the light rays coming behind him? Yeah, I forgot to mention that. We had a user <laughs> as well. Yeah. Everything always looks cool when you've got light coming through windows with like a fog machine or mister or any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, 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 the stuff always just looks so cool. And I, I, I'm i so excited that we got to work on this project with you because I've loved watching, watching a lot of your content over... I always hate saying content because it sounds like it's, it's just another dumb phrase to assign to things, but more of your work over the last uh, uh, couple of months that, you know, I, I've been brought in to work with, with some of these projects too. So, um, Thank yeah, you. let's see what, um, what are the questions that we've got in here? Um, JD says, uh, are you saying that you went full on footloose while you were in isolation for the, uh, inspiration for this piece? I don't know if I know that reference, or I know the movie Footloose, but I'm not sure what he's referencing. But yes, it's the 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 spontaneously breaking out into dance while oh. while. In. <laughs> um. Let's see here. Um. So JD three also has a question here too. It says um it might be for for me since you were saying that you don't really do too much color uh, color work for it, but um do you have any opinion on your favorite um 
709 LUTs that you use to work with? And have you ever experienced issues with um, skin tone uh, hues and kind of shifts? Because I know that everybody still has different opinions on how different cameras render skin tones. That's yeah. that's an argument that's never going to go away. Right. Um, um, so I pretty much stick to the basic Rec. 709 LUT that each each camera brand offers. Um, so I, I know there are a lot of DPs who will create their own LUTs and I, I don't really go that route. Um, but as far as skin tones, I will, I'll often change the tint a little bit um, along with the color temperature just to make sure it's looking the most flattering for the specific person I'm shooting. Oh, good to know. Yeah, so for for Alan, or actually it was for JD, yeah, you know, it, I think the the core of something like that really does come down to like you know if you're trying to be 100% clinically accurate with color, then you're most likely going to have to create your own LUT to to bring all of the colors back to what would be I don't know I I, I guess you could consider it like accurate or true to life because every single camera company is going to have a slight different interpretation of. You know, what red tones look like, what the sky looks like, things like that. That's always going to be something that you're going to you're going to go against with every single brand that you ever work with. So um, I know that there are a ton of different LUTs out there. Um, there are if you go over onto the Facebook groups, I know that there's a bunch of users on there that um, do create their own. Um, I. To be truly neutral, I can't recommend the ones. I, I can't say the ones that I personally like um, because there are so many out there. But if you go onto the Facebook groups, take a look. There's a ton out there. Um, I think just remember that LUTs are not going to be an end-all fix-all for, for every kind of shooting. Um, can't just slap a LUT on something and have it perfect, at least is what my understanding is. I, I don't know what, what, what your opinion on that is, uh, Carissa. Yeah, like it, <laughs> it might be perfect for one shot and then you go to the next shot and it's it messes everything up. <laughs> it's the most frustrating thing. <laughs> oh, man. So let's see here. Um, what other questions did we see in this chat here? Uh, ba, 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 ba. I can answer this one from Framewave. Uh, it says, is it possible to monitor audio through the Lumix Tether app if the camera's connected via USB-C or Ethernet? Uh, Framewave, the answer is no. Uh, USB-C and Ethernet, well, USB-C doesn't transfer audio uh, data over that connection. The Ethernet, you can have audio transferred and monitoring, but you have to use the RTSP uh, feed, which means that you're actually sending the recording feed out over ethernet so you can do up to 4k 60p that way um but that's more of a like delivered uh frame rate resolution color it's not really something that you're going to edit from uh you could but it's only going to be a 50 megabit per second uh output but that will encapsulate audio and video over ethernet um if you've got something like vlc or vmix or anything that can take an rtsp video feed in It'll pull whatever audio is coming from the camera microphone. Uh, let's see here. Alan asks a question. How does shooting in Vlog versus HLG profile change things when delivering for HDR? Not familiar with HDR, to be honest. Um, well, I can say the most professional way to do it is the way that Carissa and her team did it is shoot in vlog <laughs> and then actually do color grading and work with a colorist and that kind of level. Uh, HLG is a deliver ready uh, HDR profile. Uh, so what that really means is that HLG comes out of the camera in a 420 10-bit uh, file in HEVC compression. So if you take that file and load it right onto YouTube or put it right on your television... Uh, it's going to tell the display all the information it needs to flag properly for HDR on the hybrid log gamma curve. So that means that it's it's a floating curve. I, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but it floats on how much highlight information can be shown on it. It's also built in to automatically push back to 709 uh, or SDR uh, for display. But if you're going to be loading content up, I would highly suggest taking a look at some of the different videos out there from 
Uh, some of the videos that we've posted, Photo Joseph, some of the um, other content creators out there uh, that work in HDR, because it is a whole new world of exporting, especially if you're doing something for YouTube. If you're talking, you know, you want to export HDR for Netflix or HBO or Amazon Prime or any of that stuff, that's an even different world than what this is. Then you start getting into, you know, P3 color versus, yeah, I don't know. It's even above my head with that, so... Um, cool. So, uh, let's see. I'll wait to answer, to ask FC's question. Cause, um, so Chris, with, with working, you know, in, in all of these different kinds of, uh, projects, what, what would you say is your, your kind of like favorite kind of project that you've worked on? I mean, you, you've covered a pretty wide variety of, of types of, or, or genres of, creation so I'm, I'm just curious if you've got kind of a favorite that you've that you always go back to or want to go back to hmm. for me it's definitely narrative projects um definitely want to get more into features um i've, I've shot a couple features um but i just love comedy that is it also makes you cry it's kind of that middle area just comedy with heart or drama that makes you laugh a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's where I really feel it. Um, I love when I really connect with a script and I can help tell that story. So that's that's definitely where my passion is. Nice. Yeah, very cool. Um, so I'm trying to think. So for everyone in the chat, if you have more questions about the the BS1H or working um, with it on the project, you know, Drop them in the chat at Lumix Cameras. This is this is your opportunity to get your questions answered. Um, there's a lot of technical questions that came in that are a little off topic for this uh, stream, so we'll most likely try to save those and address them a little bit later, um, so that they're a little more on topic. But you know, so with with everything that you know is kind of uh, shifted over the last year. So from a from a production sense. Um, you know, how was, how was creating, um, this piece different, the same, or, you know, kind of, uh, a, a modification of creating before, you know, the, the kind of whole pandemic crap hit the world. Like, had, how does that affect when you go in to create something like this? Cause you, you for this project, you, you had a crew. Yeah. So I'm just curious how that, how that works nowadays. Yeah. Um, well, we shot in August, um, so not too long ago. And I mean, production is busier than ever in LA right now. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, so we've definitely found a way to make it work. Um, a lot of, you know, every production has their own COVID pro protocols now, and it's a little more um, consistent among like the studio shows. Uh, but as far as indie filmmaking, there's still, you know, rule, rules that each, set has to adopt to make everyone feel comfortable and safe. Um, so for this one, I mean, it's some, it's, it's a weird area where like, I know some, some people are requiring vaccinations or, or just a negative COVID test before the shoot. So that's something we, we decided to do with our crew, but, um, we were still masked on set, um, except for our talent and, um, individually packaged meals, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it like it was a pretty small crew um so it was i think it was fairly easily achievable for this one and we we had a pre-light day too so it kind of made it a nice comfortable um pace where we could get what we wanted nice yeah, yeah it, it, you know i I've, I've always been curious because like so i i was just in la for cinegear um Jeez, what was that? That wasn't last week. That might have been the week before. Or maybe it was last week. I don't know. All the weeks are blurring together again. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it, it was amazing to see, you know, the the people that are in production and, I mean, still taking time to come out to a trade show, which I thought was a little weird. But <laughs> actually, like, like how much is still actually really going on? So it, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, things are starting to, or have been, coming back into into kind of a, a full swing. I mean, there's what, like a year and a half worth of production backup that has to get kind of cleared through all these different yeah. projects. So 
Yeah, so let's see here. Um, what other questions we had here? Uh, JD just blinked three times. Uh, I, I, I can't. Sorry, man. Uh, sorry. I don't know who you are, but I can't. Sorry. Um, are we expecting a price drop for the S1H since the BS1H is out? Uh, why, why? They're different cameras. Um, totally different uh, purposes uh, that you would use either camera for. So um, let's see here. Uh, so off-topic questions, this project. Were there any unexpected challenges you came across when using the new camera, Carissa? Mm. I mean, aside from the fact that it's an early pre-production camera that probably had some firmware bugs. <laughs> yeah, I did have like a glitch or two for, for that reason. Um, but only, that it was easily... <laughs> figured out and then uh i'm trying to think of anything like i just had to learn the there are shortcut buttons on the front of the camera so if i had the camera a little longer i probably would have labeled each one but um i kind of got a feel for it it was nice you have at, at f-stop and iso um, color temperature just all on the front of the box camera um and then the menu was so easy for me because i knew the s1h already so i felt pretty comfortable toggling through the menu. Um, it was actually my first project um, shoot cinema project with the Lumix lenses. And um, so there was, there were times I was, you know, auto, trying to use autofocus um, with the face detection on the, on the gimbal. And I was actually really happy with how that turned out when I, when I shot the dance, it was able to, you know, keep focus. Um, and then for the last shot, the exterior shot, I actually just kind of, I set the focus to a specific range um, and shot at around an F8. So I didn't have to worry about it because there's a lot of running involved, you know, there's running and lots <laughs> of moving parts. So I, um, and it, you know, the, it doesn't claim to have perfect autofocus. So uh, I just decided to set it. And I think that worked really well for that shot. Um, and one thing I haven't mentioned yet is I shot the majority of the piece at 4,000 ISO. So I was on the high end of the dual native ISO and I, I switched back and forth a little bit, but I really wanted to test out that high range. And um, what else? Yeah, the, the high ISO kind of gave me more depth of field to work with. I was able to stop down a little more and then I shot at a slightly sharper shutter speed. I was at 144 degrees um just for that dancing quick movements yeah i'm trying to think of other things that i haven't covered yet <laughs> um <laughs> so I, alan was asking uh or is it Al actually red Redbit was asking uh the question i want to get to this one first um so with the project um did you choose the music before you started the shoot um and have it like as reference on set or was music chosen after the filming was done before yeah, there's no way it could have happened after uh, just because we had it playing on set um, and the cues, everything was uh, rehearsed to the music. Um, and I had a choreographer, uh, Kazmira Buchanan, uh, who I've worked with on, on every dance film I've done. She's amazing. Um, Clinton Kyles, the dancer was awesome. So we met beforehand and um, Kazzy planned out the dance and and all of the lighting was um, cued by the music, basically. Yeah, it, there's there's something so cool about seeing you know that that level of attention paid to in in the final product. You know where that lighting hits right on right on the beat and stuff. And like when when he's you know kind of uh, rustling around in the uh, with the sheets and stuff, like you just keep getting that like like right on on the beat it, it, it there's something so i think cathartic about seeing pieces that are done really well like that because there's so many times where, where you, you you see shorts come out where it's it's just off by a little too much it was just a little bit more practice in there it'd be that much better but this one nailed it so super awesome with this project um Let's see here. Uh, question from, um, well, okay. This question came from Alan, but we did kind of address it. Um, was, uh, Alan just went in and was watching the BTS. Um, and he wanted to know how you were managing focus while the camera was on the gimbal. Um, I think you touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, 
yeah, it, I was just on autofocus. Uh, pretty sure it was the face detection mode, even though it wasn't always on his face, but I, I think it knows to kind of grab on to a body too, like if there's no face in the, in the mm -hmm. shot. So um, it was it didn't work every single time, but it um, it worked uh, most of the time, which was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's hear it. Uh, FC asks, uh, I saw a few shots where scenes uh, where the scene switches between the whole body while shot, uh, and then zoom in on a, a hand, doorknob, or etc. Did you shoot those in one shot or do you do like multiple takes for like the different angles? Um, it was multiple takes for the different angles. Um, but if I, this is something that could have uh, been shot with two cameras, I think like, and I usually don't go that route, but I think getting multiple BS one H's is, is an option if you want to do that. Um, because it was just like a wide shot and cutting into close-ups. Um, so yeah, multi-cam is achievable, but I just focused on one one camera for this one at a time. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, let's hear, I know uh, we're coming up uh, close to the hour um, and I know I don't want to take up uh, a whole chunk of your day because I know you've got some, some cool stuff going on. So, um, Let's, uh, I'm going to put one last call out for any additional questions that people have um, and see what else we've got going on. Uh, in the meantime, um, could you, uh, is there anything, um, you know, anything kind of cool, exciting that you're working on that you want people to know about? Mm, that I'm working on now. Uh, <laughs> so I just shot a short for the Hulu show, uh, Your Attention Please, which is hosted by Craig Robinson. Um, so I don't think that comes out till February, but that was a really fun creative project uh, to work on with director Simone Baptiste. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited for that to come out. And currently I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, where I went to film school 10 years ago. And they invited me back to teach some cinematography workshops just for this month. Um, so I'm about to literally go teach a lighting workshop um, and this is a really new adventure for me and it's cool to learn how to explain concepts and how to teach and teaching is hard. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. realizing that now. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment, um, until I get back to LA in November. Nice. Well, very, very cool. Um, so it looks like, uh, we, we got pretty good on most of the questions here. So, um, where can, uh, where, where can people continue to follow you, check out your work, um, and, and, you know, kind of just keep up to date with, uh, new projects that you might have coming along the line? Um, you can just follow me on Instagram. It's at CL Dorson on Instagram. Um, you can check out my website too, caristadorson.com, though I do need to update that. Um, so yeah, Instagram <laughs> is probably the best place to follow me. Well, very cool. So, um, yeah. So with that, I uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of, out of your day today. Um, th these, these projects, these conversations, I love, I, I love this stuff. This is like one of the more fun things that I do for the company. So, uh, it's always an honor for me to have people like you come onto the, the stream and share some of your expertise and, uh, your insight with, with those of us that join. So, um, Outside of that, uh, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this week. Um, we will be back next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, however, that stream is going to be a YouTube premiere stream, so it won't be an actual live broadcast, uh, unfortunately, uh, because I'm going to be back on the road uh, up in uh, Tennessee, so I won't really be able to do a live stream from the location that I'm at. Uh, but we'll be talking with uh, at least Matt Frazier on the uh, data video integration uh, for PTZ options with the BS1H and even the BGH1. Um, so there's going to be a really cool uh, kind of semi pre recorded, uh, well, actually, yeah, a fully pre recorded uh, stream for next week. So uh, I apologize that we won't be doing it full blown live, but there will be a uh, video posting up going live at 2 p.m. Eastern next Thursday. 
Uh, with that, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Carissa, for joining us. This was awesome. I always appreciate, um, you know, when when you take your time to to join us for these things. It is a big honor, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday at two p.m. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, John. <laughs> Thanks.